So um, I actually like that this last, that's a lot to think about here, but I like that this last presentation ended with an elephant. The word elephant actually means humans of the savanna. So I think that's a little striking. Um, hmm. Welcome, and thank you for being here. Uh, three years ago, I was actually right where you're sitting. Not exactly. I was uh, in front of a computer and looking at a TED Talk done by David Chalmers, in which he talked about the need for a science of consciousness. And today, that led me to a three-year journey, really, a research journey. That is really a culminating this Thursday. And what I, what I want to talk about today is not just some of that research, aspects of that research, but really why it matters and uh, why, how it can affect the human condition and our experience. <coughs> Three years ago was not the first time I ever thought about the problem. In fact, since I was a very young boy, I was really wrapped with this idea that there's some awe, there's some mystery to the universe, that it related to the fact that we have an experience. And I would ask myself a lot of questions like, why, why do we have an experience? Why do we see anything? How can I find myself in this place, in this moment, with specific instances. And I was really privileged to be able to think about these things as a young child, to be encouraged down this path. And with that came a profound obligation that maybe I could give back. Maybe that could benefit society. <coughs> so what I want to start with as a way of introduction is actually talk about the relationship between science and the human condition, which is remarkably tenuous. Um, does anyone recognize this man? Raise your hand if you do. All right, I wasn't thinking you did, but you might actually recognize his name. He's Claude Shannon, and he's been considered the father of the information age. And this is because his master thesis laid the foundations for our digital technology, the way we store information. And then later, his later work, information theory, is, has led to things like the CD-ROM first, our cell phones that we all carry, and now the internet. And it says something about ourselves and our culture that we don't know this man's face when his technology allows us to pull it up at any moment, but we know the faces of, let's say, our favorite athletes, our favorite celebrities, or even criminals. Um, and, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today, uh, or it has a lot to do with it. This is a quote by Albert Einstein. It says, it has become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. And this sentiment has been made by a lot of scientists. Another one, a uh, considerable one, Carl Sagan, has talked about this kind of an issue. Um, we expect technology to solve our problems for us. We expect it to address global, global warming, climate change. We expect, we expect it to save us from humanitarian crises. But the truth of the matter is that technology doesn't necessarily have this savior effect. A lot of the issues we face are human issues, ones that involve the way we view ourselves and each other. So what I want to talk about today is how science, can't, how science can actually bring us together and give us human understanding. And that a human understanding that might come from a science of the mind might do more than we think. All right, here's the fun part. Let's get engaged. Does anyone want to say what they think about when they think about consciousness? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Awareness, beautiful. Anyone else? Well, you might think dreams, thoughts, awareness is great, personality, all these things are aspects of consciousness, the mystery that is consciousness. And because of that, we call it subjective. We defend it personally, like fervently, in fact. And we should. There's no experiment that can tell us we are conscious, just that there, we wouldn't believe an experiment that told us we weren't. It's the only thing that we have in our universe that we know so personally. And it's, quite frankly, the way we know our universe. So it's remarkable to me that science hasn't really faced consciousness. This lack of a definition, this generality, this mystery has, has been a struggle for science. And we're going to talk about that. But first, I want to talk about why I haven't just packed up my bags and left the scene. When I view subjectivity, I don't see it as a problem. I see it as a clue. Um, and this is actually my first intuition and why I jumped into the field. A black hole is something so massive that light itself can't escape its gravitation. And because Einstein said nothing goes faster than the speed of light, that means that an infalling observer, no information can leave the black hole, so there's no experiment or way for us to confirm 
that he exists, that his experience is real. That sounds like subjectivity to me. So Neil deGrasse Tyson is making a funny face here. But what it's meant to represent is the fact that science really fears this subjectivity. It, it makes us uncomfortable. So in order to see why science fears this sub subjectivity, we need to go back to the beginning. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used to create them. So what I want to do first is tell you the history of the mind, what got us started, how that's affected science, and then where we're going at now, in my opinion. So we can start with Rene Descartes. A lot of us think of him as the father of modernity. He was a true Renaissance man. And he was not just a philosopher, even though he was the father of modern philosophy. He was also a mathematician and a scientist. And what he did was think differently than the people around him at the time. Rather than accept everything the church said as true, he doubted everything. He started with uncertainty. I think, therefore, I am is not a testament to the mind and consciousness as much as it's a testament to the magnitude of his uncertainty. He also decided to contemplate things deeply rather than just read what people said before him. Now, I hope you all recognize this. You may not, but it's a graph. Uh, we all learned it in Algebra 1, but actually it's Descartes' making. And it's called algebraic geometry, this idea that an equation can be translated to points that form lines, shapes, or even surfaces. Um, without it, Isaac Newton, who created gravity and did a whole lot of other cool things, um, he wouldn't have had the ability to do that and would have had to do a lot more work. So this is just an example of what's so significant about Descartes. But I actually want to talk about his science and his philosophy. He did this thing called dualism. And what it did was quite remarkable. It created our new age. Because what he said was God's creation has its own agency. What it does is, is not affected by God's will. What this means is that man had the ability to reason and create rules. He created this universe that we think of as a clockwork universe, a big machine subject to math, subject to uh, our, our way of thinking. But he didn't do that without a catch. He was also a devout man. He believed in God. Um, that was one of his main meditations. And he gave the soul to the church. And in a way, this protected him. Galileo, who, who shook everything up, ended up having to recant his views. Descartes was able to uh, largely go unnoticed. This wall he made between the mind and matter is what really is, is today affecting our science, the way we think about the mind. We think of it as something immaterial. What I want to talk about is the consequences of that, that wall, how it still exists. One example, so now, we're, now we're, we're back to more modern times, the 1900s, 1920s, the birth of modern psychology. We called it behaviorism. And the idea was that there were inputs to our behavior, things we took in, and then outputs, the behaviors we made. And in between was a process. Now, the only way to study the mind was to view these behaviors and make judgments on what caused them. This black box, so to speak, left no room for the internal experience. We still were living in a Cartesian universe. And I think, honestly, B.F. Skinner, who is by no means the most radical behaviorist, says it best here. The question is not whether machines think, it's whether men do. Now, we like to think we've come a long way, really. I would like to think we, we have, too. But in honesty, neuroscience, the leading paradigm, is a computational one, the idea that a computer can help us understand how our brains work. And it has. It has led a, to a, a huge amount of data and understanding about how functions lead to very important things our brains do. But the, the central problem of the mind still exists. And we can look at it with the test that made Alan Turing famous, the idea that for a computer to be intelligent, it needs to deceive a human being. It needs to pretend to be a human being. But it does not need an internal experience. Cool. Where are we going? Where do I come in? I'd like to think that we can move away from all these examples of how technology describes our mind, how the mechanical universe might describe our mind, and instead put the mind back in that mechanical universe. By making bridges between biology and physics, specifically the brain in biology, we can go a long way into doing this. Um, information theory, the idea that uh, there's a quantifiable amount of information going from one place to another is one way of doing that. It's being done currently. Thermodynamics, which describes how a single particle um, can, can actually, a large amount of particles has, has properties separate from a, a, the single constituent parts. This could be used to describe how 
uh, a large amount of neurons, the brain essentially, is actually separate from what we know about a single one. Oh, got a little ahead of myself. And then optimization in biology, the idea that um, evolution pushes biology to physical limits that are well described by mathematics. All right, back to me, the black hole brain. That's where I think this might all be going, the paradigm shift, potentially. And what, what's important about the things I talked about is they all actually have a lot to do with the black hole. Information theory has changed our fundamental views on it. Um, thermodynamics, we call it black hole thermodynamics because there's a reflection of what happens at a black hole, and what happens with gases and matter. And then there are limits, very important limits that happen at black holes. And if we can talk about these two things in the same sentence, then we can maybe talk about the properties they both have, the brain and a black hole such as information density, it has to do a lot of processing, the complexity of the information that's happening, error correction of mistakes and, no and noise, and then maybe fundamental geometry. I have a minute left, so we're gonna go a little quickly. Last, though, if we can talk about these shared properties, we can reclaim the subjectivity we lost from Descartes. This idea that Stephen Hawking captures, not only does God play dice, sometimes he throws it where we cannot see it. That sounds like subjectivity. And if it exists in physics, then it can exist in a science of the mind. Now let's bring it back. So what? What to do about all this information? Well, the problem with technology is it doesn't necessarily affect how we think, feel, and act. A Buddhist will still meditate every day, regardless of what I say about black holes and brains. But, oh, and a businessman will still go about his business, go home, treat his kids in the same essential way. All of us has a, has a unique subjective experience that needs to be understood. But the way we see technology is that it's going to help those problems. In reality, it's really amplifying the problems we already have, the human problems. So my belief is that science is not going to be focused on technology in helping us, but actually our human understanding. So for the big finish, if we can break down the walls that, subject, that separate the subjective experience from science, we could potentially embrace the fact that there are walls between us, that we each have a subjective experience, and not look at that as divisive, but actually bringing us together. And even still deeper, if we can connect physics to the brain, we can look at the world that we see, are an observer in and really see it as a part of ourselves, and maybe find meaning in an animal's consciousness and, and each other's consciousness in a way that we haven't before. We can get back to what Rumi said a long time ago, that stop acting so small, you are the universe in ecstatic motion. Thank you.